Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Zia. Can, I, can everybody hear me? Okay. Good afternoon. Okay, very good. Uh, so my name is Zia Hedri. I'm an assistant professor at University of Pittsburgh. Um, the panel we have is mobile health, and we have four uh, very good uh, presentations lined up. Uh, so the first two, I think, are, are somewhat related. Uh, Idris and uh, Zach will be presenting uh, their work where they actually look at uh, the, the usage of these wellness technologies. Um, uh, and the third one is <coughs> looking at you know, one of the uh, very important problems in healthcare, which is uh, patient health records. And uh, Pamela will be talking about adoption of a particular technology that facilitates mobility of patient health records. And finally, Catherine is uh, going to help us understand uh, the context where these variables, which are wellness and technologies, people are using them, but the data that they generate sometimes cannot be used in clinical settings. So I think it will help us understand the context of how things are happening. Uh, the way we will work is each presenter will have about seven minutes. Um, and then at the end, we will have a discussion where we can sort of involve uh, all of the presenters. Uh, so we'll take questions at the end, uh, most of them. Uh, one of the thing is that there is some relationship between the studies, so I think there will be a better time to actually have a discussion. So let me invite Idris to present his paper. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, I want to start by thanking White for allowing me to discuss some of this work. Uh, this is pretty early work at the intersection of healthcare and this kind of uh, trend towards the quantified self, right? referring to this idea that technology is increasingly facilitating our ability to measure really in really detailed ways all kinds of things about ourselves. It's not specific to healthcare, right? So productivity, financial transactions, all kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> but we kind of know, right? We're all pretty obsessed with the healthcare applications of these things. In fact, uh, healthcare is the single, it's the dominant application of wearable technologies, this idea of the quantified self. Um, how many of you in here have a health band that measures steps in some form, right? I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of fascinating how rapid the adoption has been of these things. Five years ago, nobody in this room might have had one. Um, and I think we, we heard yesterday from IBM that they're really excited about the kind of data this generates on the supply side. Hospitals, doctors think it's extremely valuable. Um, but there's also a question around the consumer side. So we're buying these things, and I think the assumption, the conjecture underlying it is that these are valuable for us in some way. They impr improve our health outcomes in some way. Um, and I think that's actually something that we can question. Um, are these health outcomes really, are they materializing? Are they homogeneous? Are they always there? And that's kind of where I think I'm trying to explore some of those questions in this work. And um, it's kind of a case in point. Does anyone know what this thing is? The Pavlock, right? I, for, for, I'm still waiting for someone to tell me that we're being punked. This is like not an actual thing. So this thing is just a be behavior modification device where you set it to, for example, shock you with pretty painful electric shocks, depending on the level you set to change habits. So like if you, <laughs> you can, and it's out there. So I legitimately thought this was a joke for a long time. These guys were on, or this guy was on Shark Tank a few months ago, trying to pitch the shock therapy, to the and the Shark Tank guys kicked him out. Actually, the one guy, uh, Mr. Wonderful, if you guys watched the show, tried to get him to, to try to invest, and the guy was just a total jerk. I mean, the guy who comes up with a shock band is going to be, by definition, probably a jerk. But anyway, so, <laughs> so you can kind of, this is obviously an extreme example, right? You can question whether the net effect of something like this or even other wearables that are a little less severe is positive, negative, or mixed for consumers. Um, and I think... Uh, anecdotally, we've seen different outcomes. Like my wife is obsessed with her Fitbit. She's one of those people who will sit in the basement at 11 p.m. and walk back and forth <laughs> trying to beat the people on her leaderboard. Um, the other example is everybody else <laughs> who's not her. So we actually have somebody in our department who's extremely active, extremely fit. One week after she gave birth, she was walking 15,000 steps a day. 
So nobody in our department can catch her, and it's extremely demotivational for everybody else, right? So you have this question about who is it motivating, is it improving outcomes, and when, right? And the literature on this is actually pretty sparse and also pretty mixed. There's a, a very recent article in JAMA that just came out that showed that uh, people who are on diet regimes actually gain more weight if they had wearable devices. And it was a randomized experiment. They argued that once you knew that you walked 15,000 steps on that day, you would go eat like a steak dinner. But if you, you're, it was, you're kind of ambiguous about how well you did, then you might still be a little conservative in some of these compensatory reactions. Now, of course, there's still some evidence that um, this latter study shows that in some subpopulations, people had really an improvement in outcomes if they wore one of these wearable bands. Okay. So this is some of the tension that we're starting to think about. And this is early work. So um, we have data on Fitbit users. Okay. Um, and we evaluate kind of the two main mechanisms in the Fitbit platform. One is your personal goal. So that's kind of a default. You have this personal goal. And if you hit it, it give, you get a little buzz at the end of the day and you feel great. And the other piece are these leaderboards. So these are something I would call a kind of competitive social networks where you see how well other people in your social circle are doing and you can compare and compete with each other, right? So I kind of start to look at both of these things. Uh, we have about close to 500 people. Uh, these are all undergrad students that we capture over a nine month period. Translates to about a little over 70,000 observations. Um, and we estimate, again, as a starting point, two pretty simple models, but it's got all the usual bells and whistles, time and person fixed effects. And the first model we look at, and there's actually a bunch of controls. So Fitbit generates all kinds of metadata about people. Like, um, it's pretty complicated, actually. So we throw a lot of the metadata about you that's generated daily and sometimes by minute into the model as well. And we look at two main things. Is one, do you hit your personal goal on any given day? And if so, how does that affect how much you walk the next day? And the other one is if you turn on this leaderboard, just a binary measure, right? So you can choose to opt into leaderboards. And about, actually only about half of our sample turns on the leaderboard. So not everybody is using these competitive social networks. How does that affect your average daily step count uh, you know, uh, before and after? So those are the two main questions. Um, I'll give you kind of the, you know, the really high level results. Uh, basically, early results suggest that if you hit your personal goal on a given day, it results in you walking almost 1,000 steps more the next day. Uh, and we do a little bit of robustness. It's not, Brad Greenwood level robustness yet, but we're trying to get there. He's not here. So he gave me a hard time in his talk. So I didn't ha I submitted my slides on time, so I couldn't actually do that to him. Um, the second piece is, is more interesting is the leaderboards actually have an average negative effect. So the people who turn on their leaderboards actually walk a little bit less on average than those who don't. Um, and if you kind of disentangle this result a little bit more, you'll see that it's actually driven by people who over time are going down in their leaderboards, so they, they're ranking lower and lower. Um, so people are starting to kind of lap them and, and beat them on these competitive social networks. And the other piece is that um, if people stop using their Fitbit, so if the people on your leaderboard start dropping out, stop complying, you basically lower your step count, and a lot of people eventually also stop using the Fitbit altogether as a result of some of these other factors. So these. Uh, these social networks, these competitive social networks leaderboards potentially have some negative effects, uh, but it might be heterogeneous in the sense that maybe there's some positive effects for some subpopulations too, uh, but initially it looks like some dichotomous results here on Fitbit. Uh, this is funded by, made possible by a grant from NIH. Thank you. So the next presenter is Zach Scheffler from University of Minnesota. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Sorry. Excellent. Uh, so uh, this is this is also I would say very early stage research. Um, really, w what what we did in this case was uh, we were fortunate enough to partner up with a with a local uh, firm in Minneapolis that is a provider. Uh, of, of an application that helps people, uh, helps companies track their, um, their, their wellness uh, program. It, so, you know, for, for instance, if, if you are, um, 
you know, one of the, the more common uh, methods in, or one of the more common incentives in wellness programs is that if you go to the gym uh, three times a week or 12 times a month, then, then you'll get some rebate. Uh, you know, and th this is partnered up with, with the gym. Um, in this case, you know, not having to, or without having to use those, those corporate partnerships, uh, this relies on self-reported data. So, um, you know, in a similar uh, method or in a similar manner, you're, you're incentivized on a, uh, on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, I should say, uh, for the number of, of workouts or exercise activities that you log per week. Um, I, uh, in the interest of, of keeping my slide deck short, I, I didn't put too much background in there. But the, uh, really what we are looking at as far as our dependent variables uh, were the frequency of workouts, uh, how long the workouts were in minutes, and then the self-reported intensity of workouts. Um, you know, so generally speaking, uh, you know, these are all self-reported variables, and I, I recognize that there is a, uh, there's a bit of a, of a problem with that, um, especially in the intensity. Uh, one man's, you know, very intense, very rigorous workout might be somebody else's, um, you know, walk in the park, so to speak. But at the same time, you know, these are, uh, you know, these should be consistent across people. Uh, one of the, the key uh, aspects of, of this particular data set, of this particular um, program, is that there are, uh, there are messages that are generated and sent out. So the, uh, we have these two types of messages. The first is, is just kind of a generic broadcast message. Hey, exercise is good for you. Uh, they also personalize these messages as well, though. So there is a, uh, when you sign up for this, uh, this app, you take a, a personality assessment test that's based loosely on the big five. Um, that's a fairly uh, common psychology uh, metric. And, and then these, um, th these messages are, are tailored based on your, on your big five personality traits. So what we find is that the personalized messages uh, are, are positively related and, and significantly related to, um, you know, to all three of these dependent variables. Uh, generic messages have essentially no effect at all. Um, there are social features. Uh, there are weak signals in the sense, you know, kind of like likes. Um, they're called kudos in this case. Uh, you can also uh, send messages and then the, just the, the mere presence of, of your friends working out. Uh, also have positive effects on, on the three dependent variables. And then uh, somewhat less surprisingly, you know, I, I imagine to this audience, um, monetary incentives also have a, a positive effect. Uh, that's, that's kind of not necessarily what we're interested in, though, because um, that's so well studied. So just to, uh, to kind of focus in on, on these on the messages aspect here, uh, the, the personalized messages are, again, tailored to the personality of the user based on, on their personality assessment. So when you, when you send out these messages that are personalized and, and are uh, tailored to the, to the user and their specific traits, um, then we see a, a consistent and, uh, and positive relationship with, with the frequency, duration, and intensity of workouts. So um, I would say that the, the important thing to, to notice here is that we have this, uh, this consistent positive relationship with personalized messages, but with just generic broadcast messages, uh, we don't have that. So, um, again, early stage research, but you know, this this would suggest that that there is a uh, you know th this kind of lends credence to the idea that that personalization of, of messages is going to have a, a positive impact on um, on your goals. So, so that that's really kind of our, our most uh, what we're most interested in. Um, the social features. Uh, Given that, that we do have this social data set, um, you know, we have, we, we found that the kudos or the, the weak signals, likes in, in a Facebook analogy, also have a, uh, a you know, ha they, they have a positive effect on the, on the frequency and intensity um, of workouts, not necessarily the duration. Uh, and then the other two uh, aspects that we found were the, the number of friend workouts um, and then the, the log of that, so the, uh, the scale essentially. Uh, those also have have some uh, some relationship, mostly on on the log scale. You know, again, you know, these are um, th this is I, I think somewhat less uh, 
or it's somewhat better studied in, in other contexts, but you know, as in this case, we have kind of the field data. Um, so really what we're, uh, I would say our, our primary interest in this case and what we're looking at going forward is the, um, the personalization uh, and, and how we can kind of use that, uh, use these personalized messages um, to, to, you know, to, to really increase the, the amount of, um, of exercise that's, that's being performed. So um, yeah, that's about all I have, uh, you know, with apologies for the, um, for the, the number soup there. Um, th that's our, our full model if anybody has any interest with that. Uh, and I would be more than happy to talk with anybody after the, the uh, conference about this. The next presenter is uh, Pamela Sorry. Howell okay. from the uh, University of Sunny Buffalo, State University of New York, Buffalo. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. So this is w joint work with uh, Professor Sharman, who is here, Mohammed Abdelhamid, and Sanjukta Smith. So um, a lot of the key s keynote speakers today actually um, spoke about the problem that we're having now. So the healthcare system actually generates a lot of data, but not a lot of information is available when it's time to treat the patient. Um, I work in primary care, and sometimes we have new patients. The physician is unable to make decisions because he doesn't have access to the information, or a patient might have an acute illness and they don't have access to the new medicines that were prescribed. Research has shown that this might increase errors. It impedes the physician's ability to make decisions quickly, and it might uh, actually increase cost overall. So there are new healthcare models such as ACOs, medical homes, health homes, and there's also value-based payment plans. These models are actually dependent on the fact that data is available um, to optimize those kind of relationships. One health home in New York has actually chosen um, the smart card to enhance the clinical um, collaboration between physicians. What the smart card does is it actually stores electronic data. Um, you can securely retrieve it using a card reader, and you can also access it through the, um, through the cloud. The data is encrypted, um, and here I've just given some differences between the HIE and uh, the EMR. So what is our research question? So what we find as participants in the healthcare field is that regardless of what you do for patients, they're still non-compliant. So the focus of our study is compliance. What would promote the use or prevent the use of this device? We actually use uh, an experimental survey design to look at how message framing impacts um, the adoption of the smart card. So this study is motivated by the triple aim, as this is a health home, uh, part of a Medicaid ACO actually. So they believe the smart card will actually lower costs by reducing test duplication. It might actually mm -hmm. improve patient quality, say for instance at the ER, by improving efficiency. And it might also Im get better outcomes um, with improved decision making from the physician. Um, just some more about our methodology. Um, we collected data on 376 patients, but um, due to missing values from those patients, it was a sample of 277. And um, we used sentiment analysis to evaluate the sentiment of our gain message framing and also our loss message framing to make sure that those were on equal footing. Um, we have some preliminary results, so our comments and uh, concerns from any of the participants here are welcome. We found that location monitoring uh, actually significantly Im uh, negatively impacted the patient's likelihood to adopt the smart card, 
and it decreased their likelihood by about 20 percent. Um, the lost frame messaging actually reduced their likelihood to adopt the smart card by about 50 percent. There are several of these other variables that we studied such as error prevention, benefits of use, decision making, and social influence that had a positive impact on patient likelihood to adopt the smart card. We have three other models and in the, each of these models, so where the control group was concerned, there were three um, variables that impacted the likelihood to adopt. Those include <coughs> error prevention, decision making, and social influence. And in those groups that we gave a message frame, so either a gain frame message or a loss frame message to influence their adoption, only the benefits of use actually influence their decision to adopt. Um, we realize that this is an early part of the study, and it seems that the message effect has actually dampened the effect of all the other variables on the likelihood to adopt. Um, our practical contribution here was this uh, research was done prior to the implementation of the smart card in the health home and the smart card administrators were actually able to tailor the messaging that they gave to each patient and their marketing team so that they could use this to increase the adoption of the smart card. Um, this is part of a larger study. Our future research will actually include the use of the smart card and how the use of the smart card can be um, tied to the triple aim, so lower costs, higher quality, and uh, improved patient outcomes. Thank you. So the next speaker is uh, Catherine Stapleton, Stapleton from uh, Precipio Health Strategies. Yes, correct. Um, you're gonna have to bear with me on those bright slides over there, guys. I work in consulting and we get really excited over a new PowerPoint deck. We really do. So, just thought I'd take the opportunity. And we're also, as consultants, a little less in the weeds than, than some of you guys may be on a day-to-day -day basis. So that means that um, looking at this project for me was kind of a, a very large-scale literature analysis, interviews with some industry stakeholders, um, and also just, just what I've got from the feeling I work in the investment world and, and I consult in, in kind of the private equity investment world. So what am I hearing from those kind of um, money makers and um, money put her in the industries, um, for lack of a better word, and everything combined together. So you'll have to bear with me for the, last, for the next six minutes and 24 seconds, you will hear nothing about regressions or our codes, but I think we can get through it together, yeah? <laughs> All right, so a um, little anecdote to start this off here. Um, the reason that I kind of looked at how commercial wearables, which is what I'm calling Fitbits and Jawbones, et cetera, Apple Watches, um, for lack of a, a word to describe them all, and kind of their place in the provider setting, is I, I actually used it myself recently, and I'm one of those people who goes to the doctor and is just like a train wreck, like for a normal checkup, like sweaty palms, like the whole deal. So new doctor looked at me and was like, your heart rate is like not where your heart rate should be. And I was like, yeah, but look up, look at what I do on the day-to-day -day basis, it's fine. She kind of rolled her eyes a bit, and but, but it gave me a pass for like that time. So I got through it and she's like, all right, seems like you're okay on a day-to-day -day basis. So my next thought was like, all right, well, why can't we use a little bit of this all the time? Like, I realize it's not there now, but like, how would we get it there? So let's talk about that. I'm not going to go too deep into this. You guys know what mobile tech is doing. You know what mobile health technologies are doing right now. They're growing, right? So predicted to, by the end of 2016, 19 million wearables sold. They're predicting up to 110 by the end of 2018. That's a really big number, right? So we got all these consumers collecting absurd amounts of data on themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, not super usable right now for the provider, right? The other thing I'll just point out for this is Fitbit, really big market share. So that's something we'll talk about in a bit. But what it comes down to for the purpose of this research is, do these popular wearables have a place in the provider office, in the healthcare system, and if so, how are we gonna get there, right? So, let's talk about HIPAA, let's talk about FDA approval. Um, if you're a physician and you're gonna wanna integrate a wearable, right, you want the information to come out that it's actually measuring what it's measuring. Like you're not gonna take something, make some clinical decisions on it if it's not accurate. 
these wearables, not so accurate. There was a study published in JAMA recently, I think it came out this month. It was a partnership with Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Clinic and now I'm blanking on the whoever partnered with them. But the point was um, detecting heart rate from these wrist-worn wearables didn't work so well. Worked okay when you were at rest, but when you started exercising, completely all over the place, which kind of defeats most of the purpose for this. They're activity fitness trackers, so, so why aren't they good at doing that? We'd have to get them to a point. Right now, the FDA kind of has them as that low risk category, which means general wellness devices. Um, if they're gonna claim any more use than that, we know that we're gonna have to get medical grade, which is you know regulatory burden, burden that a lot of them don't wanna get into at this point. HIPAA compliance. Um, is the other factor before we get that sweet spot in the middle, right? So Fitbit's the only one right now that is HIPAA compliant, meaning it can enter into all those BAAs with different companies. After this HIPAA compliance, they lock down Target as a client, another 330,000 employees for an employer wellness contract. Big market share potential for manufacturers who are going down that road. So sweet spot in the middle of those. Um, this slide just doesn't have that much on it, so you'll just have to listen to me speak about it. Type of technology matters, right? Provider needs to be able to trust what they're getting from it. Um, needs to be reliable and valid, just like we talked about before. It needs to kind of have all of the above requirements we talked about. It needs to, instead of provide a snapshot for wellness, it needs to be a little more tailored. It's best suited to the following of a chronic condition, chronic condition management. You're not gonna walk into your doctor and say like, understand me from what my Fitbit is. It just doesn't make sense. And we'll talk about some examples later that are a little more tailored. Next thing, type of data matters. I mean, we all know this. My doctor rolled her eyes at me. She doesn't want to see raw data from my jawbone. What they would like to see is maybe an aggregated, synthesized, like high level, analyzed version of that data that says red flag here, red flag here, just pay attention to these. If you're interested in looking deeper, it's here. But no one wants to spend their time going through my data. That's just absolutely ridiculous. We know that. Type of physician payment method. Seems a little, not, doesn't go with the rest of the slide, but it's important, right? So if you're working for a physician, you're still under that fee-for-service model. There's nothing in your fee schedule. There's no code that says analyzed wearable data. So therefore, you're not gonna get paid for it. So bottom line, why would you do it? You wouldn't, right? Doesn't make sense. So the type of physicians that we're talking about here, kind of the ones who have on the capitation route. Um, maybe they're accepting a little risk. Maybe they're actually full on managing, like full risk managing a patient population. Maybe they're managing the geographical area. Like we're going down that road. It's those people who are gonna be a little more interested because they've got a stake in the game. So those are the physicians we're talking about here. Uh, let's move. The devices on the market that kind of have some use. Some of them are way above and beyond this commercial wearable that we're talking about here. There's some really good products in diabetes. They don't work quite as well as the implantables, but it's the only alternative on the market that isn't a CGM implantable. So it's great to have that alternative. Works pretty good. Um, then we can identify hypoglycemic episodes and therefore kind of make some decisions on how to adjust your diabetes uh, regimen. Then from there, we have Huntington's disease, same idea, constant monitoring, constant um, kind of sympathizing, synthesizing of data from these symptoms that may be coming in. The good thing about this one is doctors gonna get a severity of their symptoms score, not gonna get raw data. That's all that matters for them and they can actually make some good decisions on that. So potential applications, for something like a Fitbit or a Jawbone is let's say you had a cardiac event, maybe a surgery, something like that. Down the road, what we want to be able to do is give that patient something like this, track their blood pressure, track their heart rate, track their weight, et cetera, and potentially, if these are getting to that point where they're, they're pretty valid, pretty reliable, maybe we can reduce this frequency of follow-up visits. Um, of course, right now, that would be an off-label use um, by the doctor, but if we can go down the road of that FDA um, approval, that would be great. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna give like 10 seconds of kind of my overall conclusions. Um, one would be like, who are these early adopters? Your family physician with an independent practice, not him, no. The Harkin and Healths of the world, the One Medicals, someone working in direct primary care, they care about this stuff a little more because they got stake in the game. 
um, data is only valuable if we can actually bring it to that red flag level for the provider to look at overall. And uh, manufacturers cannot be working in silos anymore. So uh, what's happening right now, manufacturer makes a Fitbit, physician goes, I can't use this, this doesn't work for me. All right, let's have a conversation. Trade groups, physician associations, um, professional groups, uh, the manufacturer, you sit down, you have a conversation, maybe we bring an insurer in there just to make it interesting. Um, and then how do we drive that partnership? So uh, my next steps would be, you know, partnerships with anyone in this room. If you have, um, you know, data that you'd like to, to kind of nail down and look at this, um, I have, uh, have a lot going on and I'd love to talk offline and work with you a little more about kind of the next steps for this, the world. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, go ahead, question. Uh, question for Adrian. Uh, so can you uh, split the users that use this leaderboard into two categories, the ones that have a superstar in their leaderboard and others that don't, and try to see if the superstar effect is the one that is driving down people's tendency to walk when they are switching on the leaderboard? Uh, yeah, I think that's a great idea. So I, I'll say that, you know, I'm very open to all kinds of ideas around how to extend the analysis. But I think the one thing that's a little challenging is that superstar can be relative. How do you define superstar? So Maybe some standard deviation away from the mean if somebody is just much better than everybody else. Exactly. Is that what? Yeah, I think it's so a great look idea. Look at the tail, see if there are people. Absolutely, I think it's a great idea. So I think you have a question there. Uh, I have a comment suggestion for um, uh, for Idris and then a question for Zach. So my suggestion to you, uh, sort of building on what Aishwarya said, uh, I wonder to what extent the there is visibility within the Fitbit. So for example, you know where I rank, is that visible to everybody? So it's visible to you, but the, the challenge is that everybody actually has a different leaderboard. Yeah, but is there any interaction between participants you don't know that right I don't believe you can see where you rank on somebody else's fit on the okay. leaderboard you can okay. only see where you rank on your own so so <coughs> one thing to consider is you have a young population uh, and whether that has any effect on your yeah. results right and uh, yeah. take that into account and I guess my comment for Zach is you know you're using personality as the basis for personalizing and customizing messages uh, and one thing to consider is, you know, what's the burden of data collection in determining somebody's personality ahead of time before you can actually do this customization? Right, so um, I well, we I, to be frank, we haven't uh, we haven't really thought about that. The uh, so for the the this stage of the analysis, we we are using what we got or what was given to us by the. Uh, by our partner, um, but I will uh, I will talk to them about that. I think that's uh, your comment is well taken. Yeah, just building on that, I mean, in terms of determining their personality, you might be able to use some of their digital footprints, their mm -hmm. social media or, 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 or other tools. I know there's actually a new platform called Crystal now, which will review um, into individuals' um, information and give give you some personality estimates ba based on that. Um, the second thing, so when you're tailoring to the big five, sort of what methods do you use to make sure you're, how you're appropriately tailoring to those individual aspects of temperament and personality? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, again, I mean, what, what was done in this case was that they, uh, they were, everybody who signs up for this, uh, for this application gets a personality inventory. And and then based on the results of that personality inventory, uh, they will they will send out the messages you know based on on which dimension is is high high and low kind of on a on a broad uh, stroke level. So the for the most part, um, I, I think that that one of the things that's interesting about the what we found is that even with a, a relatively crude uh, you know personalization strategy, there is still in, in effect. So I, I think that. That you know, going into into the weeds a little more, looking at something like Crystal or or their social media uh, activity, you know, I, I think that that's a that's an interesting road to go down. Yeah, I'm just curi curious what like uh, tailored messages for someone who's highly neurotic or not neurotic might might uh, <laughs> might look like. But really interesting work. Uh, Ravi. 
question for Catherine. The, as you probably know very well, the market for valuing healthcare technologies, the standard valuation technology, the hockey stick model, doesn't work with healthcare because of two primary hazards. The people that pay are not always the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries do not always pay. That's unlike most other venture capital models. This is an issue that, so we use all kinds of revenue-based models, et cetera. Have you looked at anything, interesting ways of valuing adoption, valuing the stream of benefits for the two beneficiaries, the direct beneficiary, the patient, and the indirect beneficiary, the healthcare provider or the insurance provider? Have you looked at any of these models, and do you think they will inform your research? Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. And, but the way, so um, in a former life, I, I worked in an employee wellness and seeing a, kind of a model you're talking about, but in the workplace. Um, so that's kind of how it's set up right now and, and what kind of drove my thinking in that direction in terms of um, employer buying Fitbit for employee employee in a way is beneficiary mm -hmm. of this but the employer is hoping that it's going to make a difference right on their end based on premiums um so that would be the model if i was thinking about kind of using as as, as a, a way to go down that path i think that would be an interesting way to go it honestly we don't that is the model that's kind of been worked in terms of one person giving it to another in hopes of getting something in return that's the model we have um there's just very limited um, even evidence of, of kind of implementation in place. I mean, you have kind of like the Carolinas Health, you have Duke, who've just integrated uh, wearable data into their EMR. But I mean, it, that happened, you know, maybe a year ago. It's, it's what, there's little that we're going to get out of that. But I think it would be interesting to think about the employer-employee relationship and if we could use that in some way to translate over to kind of an insurer patient relationship or a provider-patient relationship. Because I'm assuming that the you know who is going to be providing this device is a whole another issue to talk about and the provider is probably not going to be doing that maybe it would be in a in one medical i mean these groups are offering yoga but right before your primary care appointment so maybe they actually would be because that's kind of their ball game um but I, I know a lot of insurers also have have kind of rebates and things like that so i think that's how i would apply the, the kind of beneficiary relationship you're talking about, it would be a really interesting thing to go down. So I'll share some data offline with you, but the place that is farthest along in this area is Singapore. They have a universal single care provider. Yep. And Singtel, the telecom provider, is beginning to actually subsidize, and they're going to be indirectly subsidized by the insurance provider. Yep. So we're doing some work with National University of um, National University Hospital System of Singapore, yeah. where they actually have different subsidy models. We can take that offline. I can yeah, and that would be wonderful, because honestly, if you're trying to find data in the US right now, you're going to have absolutely zero luck. Time for so, uh, okay, my question is also to Catherine. So uh, I would like to know your thoughts about the recent payment reform, right, on the doctor side, uh, like a macro or MIPS, right, uh, you know, PQIs. Yeah. Will this have uh, some implications to improve the buy-in of physicians? For mobile devices. You know what, I think the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about the payment reform and, and all of the change that are coming down is if you're a physician and someone says to you, hey, like you're you're sharing risk with us, or maybe you're full risk, like maybe maybe you're just in a in a in a profit sharing, whatever the case may be. First thing if I was a physician, which I'm not, would be like, oh great more administrative burden for me to put on. I completely see that as being the first case. Um, and that's why I think it's so important to kind of have those conversations. I don't understand why manufacturers would be operating in a silo. And it, it is kind of how I said, manufacturer comes out with Fitbit, hands it to consumer. Consumer goes, oh, doctor, why aren't you taking this? And the doctor's like, this isn't made for what I need. So kind of if you sit down, like let's think about having, you know, someone from CMS sitting there with this manufacturer, with a physician group, um, maybe it's an AMA, maybe it's, you know, Cadbury's family physicians, like whatever it is, and then like bring the insurer in there. Like, let's sit down, have that conversation that like, what could actually just why would you take in data that then you would have to translate back into your macro or however that gets submitted? You know, it just, none of it makes sense to me. Um, and kind of having those conversations of like, how can we synthesize the data coming from a wearable and really aggregate it in a validic or, or whatever, you know, those data aggregation services, how can we then translate it into the same format that would be useful to then submit for your quality reporting? Like those conversations just are not happening. And I think it's just so incredibly important because uh, no 
physician needs to take on more administration or costs for that or employees or, or personnel to do that. Um, so why can't we bring that data in in a way that it's going to be delivered to the next recipient? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we're out of time almost. Uh, so thank you so much for, uh, for your questions. And you can continue the conversation with these presenters uh, uh, you know, outside after this next session, probably. Thanks. Thank you.